The Puritans often referred to God as the hound of heaven. This inspired a poet in the 1800s to write a poem called The Hound of Heaven based on the section of scripture we, we just read about how God pursues his children throughout their lives to capture them and that if one of God's children runs away from God, he'll pursue them like the hound of heaven. It's a masterful poem. In fact, G.K. Chesterton said it's the most magnificent poem ever written in English, which prompted J.R. Tolkien, the uh, famous movie director, When Chesterton said it was the most magnificent poem ever written in English, Tolkien accused Chesterton of an understatement and said, you're not giving the poem the credit which it deserves. It's a wonderful poem about a man who spends his life running away from God, trying to find satisfaction anywhere except from the hand of God, hiding in any tree or any crevice of this world that will allow him to escape God. Let me read you the first three stanzas. I fled him down the nights and down the days. I fled him down the arches of the years. I fled him down the labyrinthine ways of my own mind. And in the midst of tears, I hid from him. And under running laughter, up visted hopes I sped and shot, precipitated it down titanic glooms of chasmid fears from those strong feet that followed, followed after. But with unhurrying chase, an unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, they beat, and a voice beat more instant than the feet. All things betray thee who betrayest me. And that stanza, you see the man running over any cliff, over any mountain to try to get away from God and realizing that behind him is this constant footsteps, the constant sound of feet in pursuit of him, but more immediate than the sound of the feet, more of a burden to him than the sound of the feet of his pursuer is the words of his pursuer. The hound chasing this man is saying these words, all things will betray you if you betray me. This poem borrows language from the British fox hunts. You know, the British would release the, the foxes and the hounds would chase them and the hounds would always when ever closing they are, or as the poem says, with unhurrying chase and unperturbed pace, God's voice, God's word, God's spirit is after his children that try to flee from him. This poem, The Hound of Heaven, is based, as I said earlier, on this stanza of scripture. It's an elaboration of this stanza of scripture. The experience of this psalmist is that when he looks over the early part of his life, he saw a person who refused to obey God's word. And yet what brought him from disobedience to obedience was simply affliction. That God afflicted him and afflicted him until he was broken down. God brought him to his knees so that he would turn in faith to the one who made him. Well, this is the experience of many people. Many people try to run from the Lord. They live their life fleeing God, not wanting to bow the knee to his majesty, not willing to give him the honor that God deserves. Yet for his children, for his elect, if one of you were to run away from him, you have to know there is no escape. You have to know there's nowhere you can hide. You have to know there's no fountain in this world that will satisfy. There's no pleasure in this world that will get you to take your mind off the fact that the one who made you is in hot pursuit of you. Now, not everybody who comes to faith comes to faith in this way. In fact, if you're a parent, I'm sure your prayer for your children is, mine is, that they would come to faith at an early age, that they would always know their savior. There wouldn't be a time of their life where they spend running away from God. And yet our experience shows that that's not always the case, that many people run <laughs> and that it takes the pursuit of the Lord to catch them and break them and bring them down. Perhaps that's you this morning. Perhaps this morning you are the person of whom this psalm or that poem describes. You're a person who's running away from God, who refuses to bow the knee to the Lord. If that's you, I want you to know that you will not escape. If God is after you, he's not going to give up. He will find you. 
and he will break you down and it is much better for you to come to faith without the, the screaming and kicking. Psalm 119 is the longest chapter in the Bible. It walks through the Hebrew alphabet, A to Z. Every stanza is to its own letter. This stanza is the Hebrew letter Tate, where T-E-T-H, Tate, and corresponds to the English letter I, if you're going in order. And every word of the stanza begins with that same letter. And the stanza over and over and over again describes the chase of God after his children. And in fact, our outline this morning will be reflections on the chase, reflections on how God chases his children. The first point, the chase is according to God's word. This chase plays out according to how God's word describes it. This is the Tate stanza. Every, every verse begins with the letter T in Hebrew. And the most common word in Hebrew that begins that letter is tov, good. And so six times in this stanza, the author describes God's dealing with mankind as good. Specifically, God's dealing with him as good. Now, I want you to play a game in your own imagination for a second. If I assigned you the homework assignment of writing eight verses about God's goodness to you, what topic in your life would you choose? If you had to try eight verses, eight descriptions of how God has been good to you, which is the psalmist assignment here, what part of your life would you look to? What part of your life would you extol to describe the goodness of God? It's fascinating that the psalmist here chooses to describe the way in which God afflicted him. When he looks for evidence of God's goodness in his life, he doesn't look any further than his afflictions. He sees how while he was running, the Lord afflicted him to bring him back to himself. So this psalm is really paradoxical. It's about two things, the goodness of God and the afflictions of the one who runs. It's a paradoxical concept. I mean, obviously God is good. If you win the lottery, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to see how God is being good to you. <laughs> but how is God being good to you when you... Get fired from your job, crash your car, drop your cell phone in the swimming pool, have an argument with your family, get betrayed by friends, have a trial in health, have the death of a loved one. At the end of that day, how do you look back at it and say, yeah, I see the Lord's goodness all over this day. Yet that's where the, the psalmist is. This is a psalm about how God is good because he operates, verse 65, according to his word. Psalmist begins by saying, you have dealt well, that's the Hebrew word good, you have dealt good with your servants. Why did God deal good with his servants? Because he dealt with him according to his word. This is the basic principle in which the world operates. All things exist to glorify God. To use an analogy from the world of physics, the basic principle by which all physics operates is the law of gravity. <laughs> You can ignore the law of gravity. It will probably hurt you if you do that. Or you can accept it as fact and all of physics flows out of that fact. Theology has a similar concept. In theology, the equivalent to the law of gravity is that all things exist to glorify God. Now you can accept that and believe it or you can reject it and run from it. And if you do that, it will hurt you. <laughs> and then all of theology flows out of that premise. That everything exists to glorify God. Everything has its significance in how it relates to the Lord. Things that bring you joy, bring you joy in as much as they relate to God and his character. So everything in the world either increases your love for the Lord or distracts you from your love for the Lord. Everything has its significance in how it glorifies God. And if you run from that truth, the Lord will thwart you. The Lord will close down the other areas of pleasure that you're seeking. If you find joy in other areas, do not be surprised when the Lord closes those off. Or as it's described in the psalm, do not be surprised if the Lord afflicts you to help you see the folly of your life. If that happens to you, God is not being mischievous. He's not tricking you. In fact, he reveals exactly what he's going to do in his word. That's the psalmist's point here. All of his affliction to bring him to repentance, all of it was according to God's word. God's not being sneaky here. He says what he's doing. He says, if you run, he will track you. He says, if you try to find pleasure in other places, you will fail. He says, all things work together for your good and his glory if you love the Lord. And yet, 
People don't want to let go of the other things that they're treasuring. So instead of receiving love and glorifying the Lord in their life, they run. This is the experience of the author of the hound of heaven. He, he writes this as he's fleeing the Lord. He says, for though I knew his love who followed, yet was I sore adread, lest having him, I must have not beside. Notice what the poet is saying, that though he's running, though he's living his life in dread, terrified, he refuses to repent because he recognizes this truth, that the Lord demands all of your heart, and he's not willing to give it. He would rather live his life in terror than turn and cling completely to the love of God. And that's, this is a true statement, that everything exists to glorify God. Now, if you love the Lord, if you're a believer, you hear that statement, that's a, that's a cause of rejoicing, right? If you love the Lord and you hear the sentence, everything exists to glorify the Lord, you rejoice. But if you don't love the Lord, if you love the things in the world, then you hear that sentence and it stumbles you. It frightens you. It causes you to run. If you love the things in the world and you hear somebody say, everything exists to glorify the Lord, you run the other direction. But for those who run, God has a way of tracking them down. If you believe that everything has its significance in how it relates to the Lord, then the most precious thing he can do for you, the single best thing God can do for you, the best way he can show you his goodness, the, the goodest thing he can do for you, is to give you his word. And that's why verse 66, which initially might seem out of place here, but it's how verse 66 fits in. Teach me good discernment and knowledge, for I believe in your commandments. If the Lord is good and everything he does is according to his word, and if you run from it, he'll chase you, and if all things in the world have their significance in that they relate to God and his glory, then the best thing God can do for you is to give you his word. The word discernment here in Hebrew, it means the ability to taste or to smell if something is, is rotten. To open it up and smell it or taste it. No, that's rotten. Don't eat it. Or this is fresh and healthy. Eat that. That's, the, that's why discernment is a wonderful translation. What a great English word for that concept. That you can discern if something is good or harmful. That you can discern if this is of the Lord or if it's not of the Lord. And how do you do that? How do you have discernment? Is it based on your feelings Certainly not. It's based on the word of God. That's why the author says, teach me discernment because I believe in your commandments. Discernment is based on the foundation of living on the word of God. This is why trials help you grow in discernment. They drive you back to what the scripture says. Some people say, you know, this trial was good for me because during the trial, I felt close to the Lord. Well, that's good, but that's not the point of a trial. If I can quote the venerable Steve Hawley. <laughs> Steve said this week to me, the, the point of a trial is not to give you warm, fuzzy, spiritual feelings. The point of a trial is to make sure your life is built on the foundation of truth. That's why James 1 says, consider it all joy when you encounter trials. If you could rip one verse out of the Bible, I mean, who wouldn't choose that verse, right? <laughs> Count it joy when you consider trials. Who says that kind of thing? Why would you consider it a joy when you encounter a trial? Because a trial is the way of showing you if your life is built on the scripture. If your life is built on feelings, trials will drive them away. But if your life is built in the foundation of the word of God, trials expose that and they confirm your faith. That's what James says. Consider it joy when you encounter various trials because this testing, these trials prove your faith by showing you if your life is built on the word of God. Charles Bridges, a pastor and Puritan pastor in England said, we cannot fail to observe a very common defect in Christians. Warm affections connected with blind and loose judgments. <laughs> Warm affections and lack of discernment those English Christians had hundreds of years ago. It's nothing like that would exist today. The only way to acquire discernment 
is to live your life based on what the scripture says. To recognize the world exists like verse 65 says, according to God's word. And that's why you need discernment. Scripture is what teaches you how to live your life in light of the fact that all things have their relationship to God. You need scripture to live. It's, you don't need a map, you need a guide. And that's what scripture is. You don't need a textbook, you need a teacher. And that's what scripture is. It teaches you in the schoolhouse of Christ. Well, the chase is done according to God's word. Secondly, the chase afflicts you to sanctify you. It afflicts you for the purpose of sanctifying you. The psalmist had led a full life. He had led a prosperous life. He was wealthy. And yet all of his prosperity did not cause him to fulfill his duty of repentance. All of the prosperity he had never drove him to repent and trust the Lord. And that's why this verse says, look at the majesty of theology packed into these few words here. Verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray. I just want you to think about that phrase for a second. Before he was afflicted, he was walking on the wrong path. He had strayed away from God's truth. He had left God's truth and was living his life in disobedience. Strayed implies that he knew where the path was. He should have been on it. He left it. He deviated it for his own path. He was living his life his own way without regard to God and God's word. He had gone astray. That was before he was afflicted. And then the Lord interrupted his straying. By hunting him down, and he experienced affliction. This is exactly what the poem, The Hound of Heaven, goes on to describe. Nigh and nigh draws the chase. The chase goes on and on, in other words. With unperturbed pace, deliberate speed, majestic instancy, and past those noised feet, a voice comes yet more fleet. Lo, nothing contents thee who contentest not me. Lo, all things fly thee. For they flyest from me. In other words, if you look at that stanza, what the author of the poem is saying is he's running. The chase goes on and on and on. And he's running and running and running away from God. And yet he sees everything in the world running from him. He can't find any refuge or pleasure. Everything flies from him. And in the poem, he hears the voice, the one pursuing him say, everything is leaving you because you're leaving me. That's what this pursuit looks like. God being the hound of heaven, chasing those who run away from him. Jeremiah Burroughs, the Puritan author from the 1600s, compared our affections to running, waters in the, running water in the pipes of a house. And when I read that this week in his book, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, I thought, they had running water and pipes and houses in 1600s in London? They do, I learned this week, and I'm sharing that with you. <laughs> he compares the running water through the pipes to the affections of a person's heart. And he says, if your affections for the Lord are weak, there's not enough pressure in that pipe. It's because your affections are dissipated. And what God will do is he'll shut off those other pipes in your life. He'll close down those other pipes by breaking away those other things that you have affection for to increase your love for him. God knows every heart. And he knows the way to close down those other things you find joy in. He knows the best way to reach every human heart. Some people can only be reached by sickness or by disappointment or by the loss of their possessions or property or bereavement or of broken hopes or of rebellious children or of the ingratitude of others or of the malice of enemies, the loss of a job. There's 10,000 ways that God knows how to break down the hearts to make it ready for the gospel. As a farmer breaks and pulverizes the soil to prepare it for a seed, God will break the heart of the person who's fleeing from him to get it ready to receive the gospel. That's the experience of the psalmist back in verse 67. Before I was afflicted, I went astray. But now I keep your word. Notice that glorious theological dividing line. Before he didn't keep God's word and he was afflicted. Now he keeps God's word. That's all that's changed. The afflictions haven't changed. We're going to see as the stanza goes on. His life is still filled with afflictions. Even after faith, he still has afflictions. What has changed is not his prosperity. What has changed is not the lack of afflictions. The only thing that's changed is his attitude towards God's word. Before he went astray, God afflicted him. 
He realized he was going astray. Now he loves God's word. That's the difference. He delights in God's word now. The only thing that's changed is his attitude towards this book. I want you to see it. This is a determinative book. How you respond to this book is how you will spend eternity. Do you reject God and his word? Then you will be disciplined and punished by him. Do you receive God and his word? And do you delight in his law? Do you keep his word? Then you're spared. This is what the affliction does in his heart. It makes him see he was running away from God. At what point during his affliction do you think he received it as something that was good? (laughs) Do you think it was in the middle of the trial? Do you think in the middle of the trial he realized that God was working for his good by afflicting him? That's generally not the experience that people have. Generally the experience is in the rearview mirror, looking back on it. It was good that the Lord afflicted me. Looking back on it, I see how it drove me closer to him. Like I said, the afflictions don't go away, though. Once he starts obeying God's word, the afflictions are still there. Look at verse 69. The arrogant have forged a lie against me. That phrase, forged a lie, it's they've knit, they've sewn together, they've sewn a blanket of lies around him or a tarp of lies. They've smeared it over him is the Hebrew word. There's this idea here that the arrogant he's surrounded with have woven together a patchwork of lies and are suffocating him under this tarp of their lies. They've smeared it over him. How does he respond to all this opposition? How does he respond to this trial? Well, now that he's on the right path, look at his response. With all my heart, I will observe your precepts. The arrogant lie, but he doesn't retaliate. He obeys God's word. He goes on to describe the arrogant in verse 70. Their heart is covered with fat. What a great word picture that is. In Hebrew, it's their heart is, has fat upon fat. Their heart is encased in fat. It's good in barbecuing, bad in the Hebrew language. In Hebrew, it's an idiom. It means your heart can't feel anything. If you're covered in fat, it means you don't feel anything. It's a Hebrew phrase. He's saying the arrogant people, their hearts are so dull and so dumb, they don't feel any of the afflictions. God could drop a piano of a trial on them and it wouldn't affect their heart. They don't feel it. But for God's children, the effect of the trial is to provoke you to repent and to drive you back to the right path. Now, this psalm is filled with references to other scripture verses and quotes of other Old Testament scripture verses. Normally, I don't talk about about them. I just let them slide for time's sake. But I think it's important to pull the car over here and look at this one for a second. Verse 69 is actually a quote from Job 13. And you don't need to turn to Job 13 or anything, but I think it's significant that he's making his connection to Job here for this reason. It's very easy to misunderstand what I'm saying or what he's saying here. If you're going through a trial or an affliction right now, it's very easy to misunderstand this and think that your trial or your affliction is caused because of your sin. That's not what I'm saying, and that's not what the scripture is saying. Think of Job. Was Job's trial caused because of Job's sin? No, the opposite is true. It was caused because of his righteousness, really. Your trial that you're going through, it might not be because of your sin. It might be because of somebody else's sin. It might be just because you live in a fallen world. You know, it's like a a car accident. You could get in a car accident. It could be your fault. It could be the other person's fault. It could be nobody's fault. It could be just that we live in a world where cars run into each other. (laughs) If you're going through affliction in your life, it could be because of your sin. It could be because of somebody else's sin, somebody else's sin against you. Or it could be because you live in a fallen world where Adam and Eve sinned. It's because of somebody's sin. You've got someone to blame. It could be you, the other guy, or Adam. Blame one of those three people. You don't know. But look at the end of Job's life. Did Job have sin to repent of? Definitely. Is he a person? Of, <laughs> yes, he has sin to repent of. And he does at the end of his life. The trial that he went through exposed sin in his heart that he didn't even know was there. <laughs> the main sin Job confessed to, by the way, was not trusting God through the trial. Not trusting God as much as he should have through the trial. Well, 
Any one of us can be in any trial and have that sin to repent of at the end of it, right? At the end of a trial, can any of you say, yeah, I trusted God exactly as much as I should have through that trial. I never doubted his goodness. No way. No. At the end of every trial, you can confess that because it's true. You're a person. So let me put it to you this way. If you're going through an affliction or a trial right now, I'm not saying it's because of your sin. It could just be you live in a fallen world. I don't know why you're going through it. But I do know that you are going through it to sanctify you. That at the end of it, you can always look back on it and say, I could have trusted God more through that trial. And if you do that, then that trial works in your heart to expose sin in your heart and expose a place for you to grow. That's why the trial is good for you. Because it shows you that your heart is sensitive. It shows you that you can grow in spiritual maturity. This is why Jerome, the famous Bible translator from the 5th century, said this. Quote, nothing makes my heart sadder than if nothing makes it sad. Trials are good because they sanctify. And that's the goal. It makes you delight in God's word more. If there's any difference between you and your unsaved neighbor, let it be this, that you delight in God's law. Why should you delight in it? Because God is good. And that leads to the third reflection on the chase. The chase proves God's goodness to you. The chase proves God's goodness to you. Look back up at verse 68. You are good and you do good. In some sense, this is the verdict. This is the anchor of this stanza here. God is good and he does good to you. I mean, that is a massive statement to make. When you look back over your life and you see all the afflictions, all the trials that were all happening to your life for the purpose of sanctifying you, for you to look at them and say, you know what? I see all these trials and God is good and God only does good. I see these afflictions, I experience them, and the result of them is that I can attest that God is good. This is his theology. And notice that his theology is not disconnected from the real world here. God is good, and his attribute of goodness influences the way he sees what God does. He looks at all of the things God does with good colored glasses. <laughs> he looks at everything that comes from God's hand, and he receives it as good because God is good. Amidst all the affliction, all the enemies, all the lies, all of the opposition, he says God is good and God only does good. This is why your theology matters. It influences how you see what God does. It helps you see where God is to be treasured. Everything God does is good. Everything that happens under God's Authority is good. When God gives happiness to those that don't deserve it, it's grace and that's good. When God bears with patience provoking sinners, it's his mercy, which is good. When God brings judgment to provoking sinners, it's his justice, which is good. When he defends the innocent, it's God's righteousness. And when he forgives a sinner, it's his mercy. Uh, everything God does is an expression of his goodness. And the chief thing that God can do for you to express his goodness to you is to give you his word. You should have that attitude every time you have your devotional. Every time you open your Bible and look at the text. Bring to mind the fact that this is the best thing God can do for you is to give you his word. This is it. This is the pinnacle of his goodness. He has given you his word. You are good and you, you do good, the psalmist says. So teach me your statutes. And then verse 71 and 72 here are a pair. And they're, they're the verdict. They're the, the psalmist at the end of his life looking back over the course of his life. We saw last week he was examining his ways. Now this week he's considering all that's happened to him. And this is his verdict. It's a stunning and a staggering verdict, really. Verse 71, it is good for me that I was afflicted. Who says that kind of thing? It is good for me that I was afflicted. This is the confession of a spiritual giant. This is what makes somebody a, a Christian oak, unswayed by the winds of the world. When somebody can look at the affliction in their life and say, this is good that this happened to me. That's a staggering thing to say. Why is it good that he was afflicted? Verse 71 gives you the answer to that riddle. So that he could learn God's statutes. He comes to the end of his life and he looks back over his life and he says, this was all good because it taught me God's word more. It was Martin Luther who said, I never knew the meaning of scripture until I was afflicted. This psalmist 
knows what scripture means because he went through affliction. When Jesus says to us, in this world you will have affliction, you will have persecution, in this world you will have trials, it's not a threat. It's a promise of his love. It's a promise that the affliction you face will sanctify you. So that when you come to the end of your life, you see how some of the most precious times, some of the most precious things God did for you were in those times of affliction. One author wrote that a person who can say this, this stanza here, at the end of his life, he will never be able to say there was one trial too many. He looks back over the course of his life. He's on the verge of glory. He's on the verge of entering into heaven. And he sees all that the Lord did in his heart. He won't say, that was one trial too many. He will glorify the Lord for all of the sanctification that took place from all of the trials. Verse 72, the law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of gold and silver pieces. Thousands in Hebrew is just an exaggerated pile. He's saying the law of the Lord is better than a massive pile of gold and silver. Earlier I said, if you win the lottery, it's easy to see God's goodness to you. I think if you understand the stanza, you'll disagree with that statement. You'll want to argue with me on that. If you understand the stanza, you'll say, if you win the lottery, you have more things to distract you from God's goodness. That's where the psalmist is here. He was not a poor man either. He had his wealth. He had his gold. He had his silver. But he looks at it. And he says, I'm dismissing that. Better to know God's law than to win thousands of lotteries. <laughs> Better to know God's law than to have pleasure anywhere else. And that takes you back up to the first verse of the stanza again. Drag your eyes back up to the very beginning. You have dealt well with your servant. I want you to realize that every one of us should be able to join the psalmist in saying that. Every one of us should be able to say, God, you have dealt well with me. Regardless of the trials, regardless of the tribulations, regardless of the difficulties, regardless of the afflictions, God, you have dealt well with me because you've given me your word. If you're running from God, you won't escape. You won't find anything else in this world that satisfies you. Let me tell you how the chase ends in the poem, The Hound of Heaven. It ends this way. He hears the voice of the one pursuing him say this, all which I took from thee, I did but take, not for thy harms, but just that thou might seek it in my arms. In other words, every, every pleasure I stripped from you, I didn't strip it from you to harm you. I stripped it from you so that you would seek pleasure in me. Rise, clasp my hand, and come. Is my gloom, this is now the one who is running, is my gloom after all, shade of his hand, outstretched caressingly? Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Only God can say this to someone. Only God can pursue someone in this way. If I told you I was going to pursue you and afflict you until you gave me the kind of love and affection that I deserve, <laughs> we have a word for that in English. It's called stalker. <laughs> we have a remedy for that in English. It's called a restraining order. <laughs> but when God says, I will pursue you and take things from you until you find that your only pleasure can be in me, it's mercy. So that when we can say, my gloom, the thing I was running from, after all, it was just the hand. It wasn't the hand coming to strike me. It was the hand to shade me, to rescue me. Ah, fondest, blindest, weakest, I am he whom thou seekest. Lord, we come to you today with grateful hearts that you have sought us out, that you pursued us, that you rescued us from a life of sin and brought us into your kingdom. Lord, you have been good to us. Your goodness is seen chiefly in your word, which describes to us how your son took the sin that we deserve, dying in our place. Your son gave us his life so that we might live. Your son gave us his love so that we can be loved.
Your son gave us his righteousness so that we can have joy in him. Thank you for rescuing us. Thank you for rising from the dead because you're the author of life, showing us that we can have fullness in life when we believe in you. Lord, if there's anyone here this morning who's still running from you, I pray that they would stop today. They would turn to you today. That they would confess their sins and say that they are the ones whom you seek. Be merciful on us, Lord, because of the mercy shown to us through Jesus Christ, we ask in his name. Amen.